I've been asked to speak on the topic of reconnecting to true purpose. And it's a difficult topic to speak on because just like each and every one of you, I am also on my journey of discovery. You know, even if you meet an 80-year-old man and ask him or an 80-year-old woman, have you found your purpose fully? They might tell you that I have found part of it. There's another part I am still looking for. Purpose is defined as the reason for which something is done or created or the reason for which something exists, okay? Now, closely related to purpose is something called vision. Vision is your personal perspective on how you commit to living your life. So today I want to tell you that your purpose and your vision are very interconnected. Once you give someone a vision, a goal, a destination, it changes their resilience. It changes their perspective. They are able to go further just by picturing. Do you have a vision today? What is your vision? Now your vision is what will enable you to achieve your purpose. And I know this word purpose for the young men and women who are here today, it's a very scary word sometimes. I remember 15 years ago or so, I think that's the first time I heard the word purpose, was from an American preacher called Rick Warren. And Rick Warren came out with a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And I don't know if the book was read in churches like this, but where I was, everybody was talking about it. This purpose, purpose, purpose. And for me, it was very confusing. Because whereas I had many interests, I did not have that one thing that I could say is my purpose. But with time, God has helped me to have a different picture of what my purpose actually is. And I believe that purpose, just like success, is not really a destination. We never quite get there. But purpose is a journey where we keep going on every day, guided by God. Because I know a lot of young people who walk around this town saying, I've never known what my purpose is. It's frustrating, it's confusing. I'm here to say, even if you're not very clear about what your purpose is, I know that for me, following after God has helped to clarify that. Life is a series of ups and downs. I don't know what season you are in today. I don't know if you are on the up. If you are on the up, maybe the job you are waiting for has come through. Maybe your school fees have been paid. Maybe you have gotten the exam result you wanted. Some of you may be down today. And you know, when I look at the Bible, I look at a man whose story is so great, but who, just like you and I, had ups and downs. King David. One minute, he had slain Goliath and everyone is singing King David's praises. Another minute, he's lost his son in very tragic circumstances. Or his other son is chasing him out of the kingdom. One minute, he is doing unbelievable things for the kingdom of God. The next minute, he is participating in activities that will cause him great moral failure. King David, the great, the nation of Israel holds David King David is like, I don't know who in Kenya, a legend. But he was a man and a human being just like you and I. And you know what I like about King David? In Acts chapter 13, verse 36, the Bible records that when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Let's look at some lessons from the life of David. The first thing you see from his life is that knowing God is the key to your purpose. That one I personally have experienced because the Bible tells us that David was chosen to be king because he did what Saul did not do. He had a heart after God. The Lord says that I sought a man after my own heart to be king. Saul was not a man after my own heart. David was a man after my own heart. Let me tell you my story. Many years ago, I was in university, and I was looking for 
my mission in life. I was doing a different course then. I was doing computer science. And I felt that whereas I enjoyed the course, it was not really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so when I finished university, I began working in different places. You know, in Nairobi, looking for a job is a full-time job. So when you find work, you don't refuse to do it. So after university, I did about three or four different jobs. I worked for about three, four years before I decided I'm going to try out this media. Now, one of the interesting things was that because I had not studied journalism, I had no idea how I was going to get into media. And I tried to call the people I knew who knew how media works and all this sort of thing. I, it did not work. They were just not able to connect me. But I remember, especially for the, for the period of about one year, when I was at home, jobless, wanting to get into media, trying to go for auditions, and no one is calling me back, I remember really praying to God and ask him, God, if this is your will, open this door. And if you open this door, keep me in that space. May I always be available when I'm called to go and speak and to encourage young people. The reason I come and speak in churches like this and schools and universities is because I told God, if you will open that door for me, when people call me to come and speak and to encourage young people, I will not refuse. And I trust that God sees me still faithful in that. And so I was praying and asking God, open this door. And God one day opened it. You know, when I, you know, sometimes as Christians, I think we don't really believe in the power of prayer. Sometimes a prayer is answered and you almost tell God, in you, Wongo, is you kweli. You can't believe it. And so in the year 2009, I joined Citizen TV. First, I joined uh, hosting a show called Zinduka. It was a youth entrepreneurship show for about six months. After that, I uh, get a chance to be a sports host on the morning show. After that, I get to join the sports desk as well. I was a sports reporter for about six, six and a half years. But something very interesting happened to me mentally during that time. You remember, I had been jobless for a very long time. And so for me, whereas I was looking to serve God in my job, the truth of the matter is I was looking for a salary. And I get my first job and my first salary hits. And I think to myself, now I am rich. And I move out of home. And I find I am poor very quickly. The expenses were multiplying by the minute. And so I work, I work, I work. And I find I've, after a few years, I get a pay rise. And I think again, now I am rich. And a few months later, the expenses rise again. And I find I am not as rich as I thought I was. If you don't ask yourself why things happen, you will not gain wisdom. Those experiences were teaching me a lesson. They were teaching me that on this earth, Quite honestly, for a majority of us, the money will never be enough. Now, I'm not saying don't work hard. Maybe some of you will be the billionaires we read about and we write about. But the way the human heart is created, whenever you get something, you want more. And so every time I got maybe a little pay increment, I found that a month or two later, I wanted more of it. And so I was never satisfied. Then I thought to myself, if the money will not satisfy me in this media, maybe the fame will satisfy me. And so I remember I was a host of a morning show and a few people knew me. And I thought to myself, now they know me. But then I was working in a media house which had some of the biggest celebrities in the country. And I suddenly realized, kumbe apa, I'm a very small fish in a very big pond. And I wanted more fame. And I remember in 2012, God gave me an amazing, amazing opportunity to win an award. I was new in the media. He, he actually gave me a story. I don't know how to explain this, but I saw a story idea somewhere, and it's like God placed it in my heart. If you tell this story, this story will take you very far. And so I went and did the story um, about uh, Masai's playing cricket somewhere. 
And the story went on TV. And I remember one day I was in church and something just told me, that story that you've done, you will win an award for it. And I remember telling the cameraman that we had done the story with, please prepare your passport. We are going to win an award for this story. And the cameraman looked at me. He thought I was crazy. And I kept reminding, every time we would talk, I would tell him, passport yako yako tayari. And one day, you know, we had applied for that award. It was a CNN award. One day they called us and they told us you have been nominated for it. Prepare your passports. What I had been telling the cameraman, you are going to Zambia. And so going to Zambia, we won the award. And I came back and I thought to myself, now surely you have fame that you can relax about. But this thing called the human heart, it is so wicked. You come back and you think, okay, now they know me in Kenya and in Zambia, but they don't know me across Africa. And there I had another moment where I said, the money is never enough. The fame is never enough. And I actually sat and asked God, so what have you put me in this media space for? And what will satisfy me? And that's when he opened my eyes to my real purpose here which is to be an ambassador for him, which is to stand up for him. And that has kept me going all this time. And I believe it is for those reasons that God has kept me in that space. And I take it back to where King David was, where I then realized that if I don't serve God in this space, then he will not provide the opportunities that I'm looking for. And so taking you back to my first point, knowing God, is the key to your purpose. Not just to get into what you're supposed to be doing, but to sustain what you're supposed to be doing. Second point, I have four points and I wrap this up. Fear God, not the giants. Is it your family? Is it your friends? What is it that you feel is standing in the way of where you need to be? King David also faced his fair share of giants. 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 34 says, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it down and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Do you know what that tells me? Whatever trial you're going through today, if you look at it as preparation, it actually will count in your life. The lions that are in my life, the bears that are in my life that are coming to carry things off, I see them as preparation. I don't see them as God has abandoned me. I see them as preparation for whatever lies ahead. But David then went on and said this, your servant has been prepared he has killed both the lion and the bear. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. 1 Samuel 17. David at a very young age, I think I'm even old compared to where David was. This was a young man who had already dealt with great, great adversity. And he had the confidence to come where grown men are and tell them, listen, this man that you fear, he's the one who should fear us. This trial that you fear, this challenge that you fear, if you serve the true and living God, it should fear you. And he can do it for you. You know, there's a story I always tell uh, whenever I go to speak to young people about the challenges of looking for a job in this city. And it's a story that has helped me because it prepared me for the challenges that I would find beyond uh, the first job. I remember one day I had been shortlisted for a job and the condition for getting the job was that you had to do a medical checkup. Uh, to check whether you're okay before they give you the job. So I show up there in the morning. I'm very smartly dressed. Those days I had one suit. Nowadays at least I have a few more. So I wore my best suit. I got into a bus. I went to this hospital. I show up at the gate. 
I find that we are many, we are like 200 of us who have come for this job. We are looking for a sales job from this company. We get to the place, we are all briefed. We are told, listen, if you want this job, this is what we need from you today. Right now, we need to take your blood, we need to take your urine, and we need to take your stool. That was the condition to get that job there and then. And so, of course, all of us now are confused. You know, Kenyans are very innovative in a positive way sometimes, but also in a negative way. And so within seconds, an innovative solution was presented. The doctor came and told us, our whole doctor, if you gather yourselves up and each of you give us 200 Kenya shillings, we will clear you to get this job. And so very quickly within our group, one of our members came and became the team leader. And he started walking around. You know Kenyans want to create solutions. He started walking around collecting 200 shillings from everyone. And you know, you know we come to church on Monday, on Sunday, but we live in the world from Monday to Saturday. And you need to survive. So that is what started going on in my mind. One, nobody will know if I give. I had 200, I had 200 shillings in my pocket. No one will know. How do I go home and tell them I've refused that job? We prayed for this job. Why are you saying the prayers were in vain? The guy went round, and I think 195 or so gave their 200 bob. Now those were 95, some of them might be Pentecostals, others Catholics, I don't know if they were Anglicans, all good members of their churches. So finally, the guy comes to me. You know me, I was thinking. So I even moved to the corner. I didn't want to stay close to them. I was really thinking. And I'll be honest with you, I was considering it. But something just to, told me, if you start giving a bribe for your first job, what will you do when you are a manager or an MD or a CEO? What will you do later on? When you see in the paper, minister fired in one billion shilling tender. Sometimes you think Alianza Uko. No, he started by cheating in high school. He started by cheating at home. That is where it begins. A habit cultivated quietly over the years will become a monster that you cannot handle and it will derail you from your true purpose. Let me finish my story very quickly. The man comes to me and tells me, Toa sombili yako. I tell him, I, mimi siko shua. Let me think. I left the hospital. I got into a bus. I went to town. Luckily, we were not too far from town. And I told myself, listen, you look for those samples, no matter how long it will take, and go back to that hospital. And so I walked into one of the best hotels in town near a major bus stop. And I sat there. I dipped into my pocket, I took a cup of tea, at least, and by the grace of God, within an hour or so, what the hospital had asked me for, I was able to deliver it. Luckily, the hospital had given me the tools. Within 20 minutes, I was back at the hospital. Of course, by now, an hour or two has passed. And I walked to the doctor's office, it's empty now, people have gone, they've all been cleared for their jobs. And I put the samples on his table. And I tell him, test these samples and give me that job. He looked at me and he laughed. I think he thought to himself, what a foolish young man you are. Don't you know how things work in this city? Why would you do all of this? He took my paper, he cleared me, cleared, tick, tick. Tick. He told me, Kwenda wewe, and he gave me the paper. And I went to do that job. And the difference between me and all those other guys is that I did not have to give a bribe for me to get the job. I faced a giant that day. But there is a God who was bigger than the giant. So whatever giant you're going through today, just like David, look at it with confidence 
because you serve the one and true living God. Very quickly, two points I've already given you. One, I've told you, knowing God is the key to your purpose. Two, I've told you, fear God, not the giants. Three, don't allow setbacks to slow you down. It's been a crazy two years for many of us. I know some of you have lost jobs. I know some of you have gone through terrible things. You've lost loved ones. You feel like you've lost your purpose. I'm here to tell you today, don't give up. Don't give up. Life is a series of ups and downs. If you're down today, you might be up tomorrow. But if you give up, you have no way of knowing. So don't give up. And you know, King David was in the same situation. He had made a big mistake, a big moral failure. I know many of you know the story of Bathsheba. And it came with consequences. So that one, Nishida alijiingizia. And there were consequences for that. He lost his, his child, the child that he had with Bathsheba. And the Bible tells us this, that as soon as David heard that his child had passed on, major setback. Let's see what the Bible says. The Bible says he got up from the floor. He washed himself. He put the lotion on. He washed his clothes. He went to the Lord's house to worship. After that, he went home and asked for something to eat. His servants gave him food and ate. And his servants looked at him and said, are you okay? I think they thought he had lost his mind. You've just lost a possible heir to the throne. And David said to them, and I think this is profound for how we should deal with things in our lives. I want to tell you today that each and every one of you will face a setback. If some of you are told to follow God because mambo sawa sawa, let me tell you the reality. On this earth, you will have many troubles. But God tells us, be of good cheer. You have overcome. So I'm giving you a secret. When the troubles hit you like they hit King David, this is what King David said. While the baby was still alive, I fasted and I cried. I thought, who knows, maybe the Lord will feel sorry for me and let the baby live. But now that the baby is dead, why should I fast? I can't bring him back to life. Someday, so David had hope that someday this situation will be resolved and I'll be reunited with my son. But for now, I move on with my life in God. Some of you have gone through big setbacks that maybe have threatened even your purpose. You felt like giving up. I don't know what challenges the last year or two have brought you. It's been a very challenging time. But I want to challenge you, like King David, get up, wash your face, take something to eat, and move on with your life. Don't just stay in that same place. They say that the things that will make a man or a woman successful is a few things. One, your IQ. IQ, your intelligence quotient. Basically, how smart you are. They say another thing that will make a man successful is PQ, your physical quotient. Whether you work out, your exercise, how healthy you are. They also say that another thing that will make a man or a woman successful is your EQ, emotional quotient how well you deal with stress and anxiety and conflict. But the other day, I learned about another way in which we are judged on how successful we will be. Your RQ, resilience quotient. Some of you, when you face a challenge, you give up very easily. But there is another group that will never give up. They fail today, they are trying again tomorrow. They fail tomorrow, they are trying again the next day. Nothing can slow you down. I want you to be in the second group. Don't allow anything, even the things that people tell you that you're a failure or you can't do this. What I've realized in this world outside is that the people who don't listen to negative criticism, the people who don't look at their failures but quickly pick things up, are the ones who are successful. Don't stop. Finally, the last thing is, for those of you looking to reconnect to your purpose, if things work out for you, remember all glory goes unto God. What I remember about David is this. David is a phenomenon 
who we still talk about today. Somebody once said that for most human beings, when you die, three generations later, they will have forgotten you. How many of you can remember your great-great-grandfather? How many of you can remember your great-great-grandmother? The reality is, once you're buried, three generations later, they might forget you. Now, imagine King David. How many thousands, I don't know how many theologians, how many thousands of years later are we from King David? King David knew that no matter what I achieve in this world, it's not about me. It's about God. As you walk in this journey called life, should you be great, should you be successful, remember, it's not about you. It's all about him. But remember as well, should you face great adversity, should you face great problems, could it be that he is testing you for what you're supposed to achieve? And you know what? When I discovered this, it gave me a balance in life. For some of you, maybe God is afraid to bless you because he knows that it will be all about you. Find that balance in life because there is greatness in this room today. Some of you are meant to do phenomenal things, but you must reconnect to the source that is God. And I pray that he'll show you what you need to do if this season has discouraged you, if it's put you down, that he'll reconnect you to what you're supposed to be because I believe we were not just put on this earth just to follow the patterns that others have followed and just to be like other people. I, I, as I finish, I have recently been watching a series on, on Netflix about tyrants of the ages. I don't want to name their names, but men and women who ruled their countries for 30, 40, 50 years and people were not able to bring them down. None of them prayed to God. With their own strength, they were able to hold together a nation for 40, 50 years and not be overthrown. Now, what about us who know God? What can we do to make life better for our fellow men if we connect to him? There was a quote I was looking for when I was seated there. I can't find it. But it says that the world is yet to see what will happen if a man or a woman allows themselves to be fully used by God. That the stories of King David and Joseph and all these men are just but scratching the surface of what would happen maybe in Kenya if some of us allowed God to properly, fully use us without fear, without doubts. We would change Mbakasi, we would change Nairobi, we would change the world. I am on that journey and I hope that there are people in this room that are on that journey as well to tell God, God use me whichever way you can. Yes, I'm afraid. Yes, the giants are, you know, yes, I'm not from a big family, but God use me. You'll be amazed. I have seen a God who can do things far above all you can ask, think and imagine. And I ask you to trust this God today.